Hi there, I'm Tom Natchu. Welcome to another episode of Fraud Squad. Now, fraudsters are usually strangers, but not always. Today, we're going to show you some cases of fraud committed by people that you not only know, but whom you trust. This is known in the business as affinity fraud. Now, of all of the frauds we've covered on the show, the worst ones involve betrayal by someone that you know personally. We tend to trust the people who are closest to us, that makes sense. Members of our church, service clubs, social groups, or even family members. This week on Fraud Squad, we're going to show you two cases where the victims never suspected, never saw it coming, that they were being defrauded in the first place. You'll meet Andrew Leck and some of his victims and learn how he devastated his family, friends, and members of his own church by defrauding them of millions of dollars. Then in our second segment, you'll learn about a scam involving real estate investments where the victims lost millions to another trusted individual. And as always, we'll show you how you can protect yourself and fight back against this type of fraud. We identified probably close to 300 victims. This was uh, a classic affinity fraud. I don't have time for this, he, okay? Uh, didn't just speak the language of the market, he spoke the language of the church. You don't want to trust anybody anymore. What? Affinity fraud targets groups of people that share something in common, such as belonging to the same faith or ethnicity, or even sharing the same social interests. In this case, fraudsters preyed on church groups using their religious beliefs and their faith in the Bible to perpetuate the idea that we're all here to help each other. In the Christian community, we are to live like the Bible says we're to live, so we should be able to trust. That's, that trust is what they prey on. From what we have seen, the mastermind of the operation was Andrew Leck to a point, but uh, it would appear that the organizational mind, Gary McNaughton, lived in Ohio. And McNaughton was soliciting and recruiting his fellow church members to invest with him. And what he told investors is that he was going to, in turn, invest their money with Andrew Leck, his childhood friend, who was also a wealthy and successful securities trader. It's our understanding that he was um, an ambulance attendant, didn't have any formal training in the stock market, idolized people like Warren Buffett, but that's, you know, that's not who he truly was. The operation um, was fairly simple. Uh, it was based on um, putting Mr. Leck in front of potential investors. Uh, he would convince them that he was um, uh, extremely experienced and somewhat brilliant in the stock market. Mr. Leck gave a presentation to the group. You know, they were all here together. You know, we can all uh, we can all benefit, and I will come through. And we all believe in, have a belief in God and the Bible together. And we'll all flourish in this. We'll all benefit. A friend of ours had been investing with Mr. Leck, and he made it look very good. And um, we watched him for a while, and then in about a year, we invested. So that's how we got in with Mr. Leck, but we never met Mr. Leck. We invest, invested a hundred thousand. With the investment of $100,000, the Milligans were promised a return of 15%. And then we would get six post-dated checks in the mail. And then when the six months was up, we'd get six more. And then in April, when I thought they should have come, they didn't. And right then, I got a sick feeling in my stomach, and I didn't even say anything to Don about it. It becomes quite apparent early that the monies that he's receiving are not being invested in the manner that he says they are. Every time we invested, like if we reinvested 20,000, say, we would get another promissory note. So at the very end, the promissory note was $450,000. And then one day a registered letter came in the mail and I knew before I opened it that we were probably in trouble and we were. And it was dated April the 11th, 2003, telling us that he couldn't send us our checks at the, at the time. It's easy to recognize very quickly this, this was nothing more than a Ponzi scheme. In a Ponzi scheme, the subject will promise high returns with low risk, usually providing the investors with statements, uh, monthly, quarterly, yearly statements showing extremely high returns on their investment. And in doing so, they're enticing the investor to stay with the subject, with the fraudster. Because in a Ponzi scheme, the subject receives new investment money in order to pay off 
old investors. So a fraudster does not want a subject to cash out because if too many people cash out and the fraudster is not receiving enough money coming in, the Ponzi scheme is over. You just have no idea where to go or what's going to happen or what you're going to lose or if you're going to lose everything or like initially you just don't think straight. Where does most of the money go in a Ponzi scheme? A, into the bank account of the criminal. B, it's used to pay back earlier investors to keep the fraud going. Or C, it's used to provide a lavish lifestyle for the fraudster. The correct answer is B. In order to support the payment of high rates of return offered by the scheme, the fraudster must continue to attract more and more victims so that the new investment money can be used to satisfy the obligations to earlier investors. This was uh, a classic affinity fraud. We invest, invested 100000 It's like a house of cards. It will collapse upon itself in a very short order. We started this case by going down and meeting with some of the alleged victims at the time. It turns out that they were victims. A class action suit had begun, and law enforcement on both sides of the border were ramping up their investigations. We did a search warrant at his house. And uh, in the afternoon, Mr. Leck, uh, we recognized his car, and then, you know, we could see that he was driving around the neighborhood. And so we, we, we just called him and said, well, why don't you just come here? No sooner is he five minutes in the house, and he's beginning to uh, trying to explain how his investment scheme worked. We uh, conducted a formal interview with Mr. McNaughton, and we gave him the opportunity to explain himself, to explain, you know, what were you telling investors, and what did you do with their money, and, and how was Mr. Leck involved? Well, unfortunately, Mr. McNaughton, um, refused to answer most of our questions. McNaughton knew he was standing on thin ice in an attempt to ease his guilty conscience through 20 years of friendship with his friend Leck out the window when he delivered a disc to the lawyer with enough evidence on it to incriminate his lifelong friend. I'm not sure why Gary McNaughton gave me the disc. He, uh, however, did provide us with, I think, the key uh, piece of evidence. None of the money that we could see was invested. Mr. Leck had a number of followers that would come to court. We could see that the whole process pitted Christian against Christian. They mocked everything we did, and they formed a circle out in the hallway of the courthouse and had a big prayer service, and yet we knew what was going on behind the scenes. So that was mockery as far as their Christianity was concerned. We were in a recess, and this older gentleman came down, and he wanted to talk to me. And I said, well, come on down the hall. So we went down to the end of the hall, and I said, OK, what have you got to say? And he just yelled and yelled and yelled at me. He said they were taking all our money, and that Andy Leck would never give us anything if we didn't get rid of these lawyers. Like, he was very, very, um, he wasn't physical, but you know, I, at one point I wondered if he could have been, shook me up pretty good that day. Mm -hmm. Those who felt that we were doing the wrong thing by incarcerating him or pursuing him, uh, there was a tremendous amount of uh, energy from them. And the Milligans took a lot of scorn. I don't know if I'm tough or not, but yeah, you had to be. Because you can't back down. When you take a stand on anything and it's right, you cannot back down, and I wasn't going to. Mr. McNaughton, was uh, found guilty of uh, violations of criminal statutes and then sentenced to uh, about a five-year prison term. Mr. Luck, he pled guilty uh, to the criminal charges, so he's been in jail almost uh, 10 years. The individual will give you what appears to be official-looking documentation, a promissory note. Don't believe in it because it appears official. It has an official stamp on it. Very easy to go on the internet, produce those, write them off. If somebody has a notary signature of any of that sort, very easy to forge those. So don't think because you've got a promissory note, because in this case, those promissory notes were not worth the paper they were written on. How do you replace a lifetime of saving and pinching every penny and paying off your house mortgage? And it, because of the allure of this man's scheme and story, you gave it all away. You can't compensate for that. Putting him in jail. That only scratches the surface. The best get rich quick is just to count your blessings. 
And we have lots of those. The Ponzi scheme was named after Charles Ponzi. What kind of product did his 1920s scam involve? A. Postage reply coupons. B. Tulip bulbs. C. Gold. Or D. Stocks. The correct answer is A. Charles Ponzi promised clients that by purchasing postal reply coupons or international reply coupons in Italy, he could return a profit of 50% within 45 days or 100% profit in 90 days. David Richard Sparks ran an elaborate real estate investment Ponzi scheme that bilked his longtime friends, his family members, and his clients out of about $4 million. David Sparks was very well respected. He was well liked, he was well connected. He was involved in his church, he was involved politically. It involved someone who was on the city planning commission. He had bought and sold real estate for many of his high school friends for the last 30 years, all legitimate transactions. I often would say if, if you asked me to write down on a piece of paper the names of the 10 people that I, uh, I would most trust, his name would have probably been on that list. I actually came to know him through a group of friends through baseball. Uh, we had a baseball league. And then David helped me as my realtor buy my first house in 1987. He started to invest in speculative real estate. And in 2005, he believed that homes in Utah and California were going to increase significantly in value. And he invested some of his own money and some investors' money to buy $7 million in real estate. This was buying uh, properties that a bank needed to get off of its books at a discounted rate, fixing them up and putting them back on the market and making a fair profit. The plan was is that we would purchase jointly uh, 10 properties. These were ultimately to be purchased through my name and his name. They were then to be transferred to corporate ownership. Of those properties, David ended up owning two. I ended up owning eight. It was presented to me as a safe investment. And again, it was presented to me as the con with the idea that they would initially be in my name and then would promptly be pr transferred to a corporate ownership. And the corporation would be owned by me and Dave. But if there was a problem, the corporation would collapse as opposed to having the debt come back on me personally. When I'd asked him for information, he would supply information, but it was all self-generated. Here's a spreadsheet he created, or here's an, ex you know, here's an Excel program. There was no independent verification outside of just d whatever Dave said. I remember asking his secretary if I could see the, some of the deeds to some of the properties, and she said Dave was the only one who'd ever seen them. The properties we had invested in were going underwater. So when I confronted him, he said, are we underwater? You know, in a direct question, he finally said yes. And I said, we need to get out. Half a year goes by, he has done nothing. After about six months of excuses on why the money wasn't being returned, and all of the excuses seemed very reasonable, I just decided I needed to do some checking myself. David Sparks enlisted the services of a young woman to direct potential investor towards his own property investments. This flow of new money allowed Sparks to carry on his Ponzi scheme. The new money that was raised was used to satisfy the demands of his previous investors. According to the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office, it started with his bad business decisions. He bought a lot of real estate, about $7 million in real estate, when the market dropped and he was in a big hole. And his response to that, rather than take the hit and, and move on, he turned. Tried to dig himself out by defrauding other people out of their life savings. When I say, how, how could this happen? How could he, it was there was no sneak job. It was like one day, somebody jumped into his brain and he became a completely different person. He had accountants working for him. He had brokers working for him. He had investment bankers who were providing the loans. Some of these people, I later learned, were fictitious. They were 
figments of David's imagination, other, others of them I knew very well. None of them said, there's a fraud going on. None of them said, there's bad things going on. He has invented a fictional person who he's claimed to be his agent to go and sell these properties. He says, OK, look, we're entering a situation where the rentals don't do it. We need the money in order to hire the necessary professionals to get the property short sale. He never did that. He embezzled the money for his own purposes. So now, as I deal with the lenders on those properties, they haven't been paid since last year. In one case, he went out to the property manager and took the money out the day before I instructed the property manager on not to give any more money to Dave. Literally, he drove out there because he knew orders were on the way in order he could snatch the last few dollars away from me. And so I've been left with properties that are underwater in my name where the rentals aren't even close to covering the mortgages and all of the lenders are at the door. The thing that was striking to me is David never, never gave me the impression that he was pressed for the money. Every deal he did, he had his own money in, uh, and it was always more than what I had in. So he made you feel comfortable that way. Uh, hey, don't worry, I'm in the deal too. You know, if, I lose, if you lose, I'm going to lose even more. What is it called when a fraudster targets the members of a specific religious group? A, fraud by association. B, loyalty fraud. C, prayer fraud, or D, affinity fraud? The correct answer is D. When a fraudster targets people who belong to the same religious, social, ethnic, or other group, it's called an affinity fraud. Then I asked Dave, OK, give me the documentation so I can try and dig my own way out of this. He refused to do that, and I had to spend tens of thousands of dollars for professionals and attorneys to go and recreate the wheel and find the documents, find the loan. So I just knew which lenders I was dealing with. I didn't even know which lenders I was dealing with. Dave either took or destroyed all of the documentation. I had to go to the local title company in Cedar City through an attorney, spend an attorney's time, spend a title company's time to rebuild what all should have been provided to me free and, and at the beginning, and it never was. And I suspect David was doing that as a smokescreen to just cover his tracks. He was just trying to keep me busy, trying to dig my way out of the hole, as opposed to pursuing him. To me, the, the most heinous thing is he took his own sister, his own brother-in-law. I was shocked. You know, it's somebody that you trusted. It's somebody that you were close to. And um, it, that's, I think that rocks my world more than anything else, is the fact that a guy that I counted a close friend could do something like this. Those eight properties are still in my name. They are all in foreclosure now because I cannot afford to pay them any even close to that. And the amount of money that I owe on them is enough to bankrupt me. The law eventually caught up with him. David Sparks has pled guilty to his crimes. The US attorney has recommended a sentence of over five years in a federal prison, but that won't bring back the lost money and the devastation caused to so many investors. He's got it all figured out. He'll serve some time in federal jail, and then there will be a batch of people to whom he has made contributions now who will welcome him with open arms, and he'll go back out, and in my opinion, he'll probably do this again. And he'll be, you know, clean, free to walk away with whatever he's gotten at the back end of the deal. Now, we want to hear from you, so Fraud Squad takes it to the streets to hear some of your stories. This chap uh, would get the mail when I wasn't, I'd live with a guy, uh, so he would get the mail when I wasn't there, he'd get, and he'd open it and get all my personal information. And then over time, I found out that he'd got Rogers and his girlfriend's house in my name, and then he got pulled over by the police once, and I don't know what the police were doing, but he gave them my information, and uh, I got a ticket for speeding way up north. Uh, so I finally got the mail and found out that all these things were in my name. Uh, there was a visa, Rogers, yeah, he hammered it. So yeah, he did well. It was a long time to get everything back to your name, so it's a pain in the backside, really. George and Rose's parents had a, a company come to put louvered lines on their windows, yeah, yeah. and they gave them the cash up front. <laughs> Never saw anything about it since. I was at the... Uh near the Princess Margaret Hospital. Yeah. This guy pretended that uh, his daughter was in the hospital and that somebody just had uh, robbed, robbed him, his wallet, while he was going by there. 
and he was asking me for money and like who would uh, be sitting that right beside a hospital so and he showed me um, a paper of a police report so he actually had like a fake police report and things like that he said be here at 8 30 and i'll come back with the money and like a doofus i stood around at 8 30. my wife uh, unfortunately uh, uh, sent a, a reply to she thought it was the bank sending her asking her to update her details and she did send off an email back to what was supposed to be the bank but, it, but the banks do not email well we've come to the end of another episode of fraud squad Remember, we're fighting fraud together. For more information on this and other episodes of Fraud Squad, go to investigationdiscovery.ca.